A soft, liquid joy like the noise of many waters flowed over his memory, and he felt in his heart the soft peace of silent spaces, of fading, tenuous sky above the waters, of oceanic silence, of swallows flying through the sea dust over the flowing waters. A soft, liquid joy flowed through the words where the soft, long vowels hurtled noiselessly and fell away, lapping and flowing back and ever shaking the white bells of their waves in mute chime and mute peal and soft, low, swooning cry. And he felt that the augury he had sought in the wheeling, darting birds and in the pale space of sky above him had come forth from his heart like a bird from a turret, quietly and swiftly. Symbol of departure or of loneliness? The verses grouped in the ear of his memory composed slowly before his remembering eyes the scene of the hall on the night of the opening of the National Theatre. He was alone at the side of the balcony, looking out of jaded eyes at the culture of Dublin in the stalls, and at the tawdry scene cloths and human dolls framed by the garish lamps of the stage. A burly policeman sweated behind him and seemed at every moment about to act. Catcalls and hisses and mocking cries ran in rude gusts round the hall from his scattered fellow students. A libel on Ireland, made in Germany, blasphemy, we never sold our faith, no Irish woman ever did it, we want no amateur atheists, we want no budding Buddhists. A sudden swift hiss fell from the windows above him, and he knew that the electric lamps had been switched on in the reader's room. He turned into the pillared hall, now calmly lit, went up the staircase, and passed in through the clicking turnstile. Cranley was sitting over near the dictionaries. A thick book, opened at the frontispiece, lay before him on the wooden rest. He leaned back in his chair, inclining his ear like that of a confessor to the face of the medical student who was reading to him a problem from the chess page of a journal. Stephen sat down at his right, and the priest at the other side of the table closed his copy of the tablet with an angry snap and stood up. Cranley gazed after him blandly and vaguely. The medical student went on in a softer voice. Palm to King's forth. We had better go, Dixon, said Stephen in warning. He has gone to complain. Dixon folded the journal and rose with dignity, saying, Our men retired in good order. With guns and cattle, added Stephen, pointing to the title page of Cranley's book on which was printed Diseases of the Ox. As they passed through a lane of the table, Stephen said, Cranley, I want to speak to you. Cranley did not answer or turn. He laid his book on the counter and passed out, with his well-shod feet sounding flatly on the floor. On the staircase he paused and gazing absently at Dixon repeated, Pawn to King's bloody fort. It that way if you like, Dixon said. He had a quiet, toneless voice and urbane manners, and on the finger of his plump, clean hand he displayed at moments a signet ring. As they crossed the hall, a man of dwarfish stature came towards them. Under the dome of his tiny hat, his unshaven face began to smile with pleasure, and he was heard to murmur. The eyes were melancholy as those of a monkey. Good evening, Captain, said Cranley, halting. Good evening, gentlemen, said the stubble rolling monkeyish face. Warm weather for March, said Cranley. They have the windows open upstairs. Dixon smiled and turned his ring. The blackish, bony puffered face pursed its human mouth with gentle pleasure. Its voice purred. Delightful weather for March. Simply delightful. There are two nice young ladies upstairs, Captain. Tired of waiting, Dixon said. Cranley smiled and said kindly. The Captain has only one love, Sir Walter Scott. That's so, Captain. What are you reading now, Captain? Dixon asked. Ride of Lammermoor? I love him, Scott. The flexible lips said, I think he writes something lovely. There is no writer can touch Sir Walter Scott. He moved a thin, shrunken brown hand gently in the air in time to his praise, and his thin, quick eyelids beat off in his sad eyes. Sadder to Stephen's ear was his speech, a genteel accent, low and moist, marred by errors. And listening to it, he wondered was the story true, and was the thin blood that flowed in his shrunken frame noble, and come of an incestuous love. The park trees were heavy with rain, and the rain fell still and ever in the lake, lying gray like a shield. A game of swans flew there, and the water and the shore beneath were foul with their white slime. They embraced softly, impelled by the gray.
grey, rainy light, the wet, silent trees, the shield-like witnessing lake, the swans. They embraced without joy or passion his arm about his sister's neck. The grey woolen cloak was wrapped with water from her shoulder to her waist, and her fair head was bent in woolen chain. He had loose red-brown hair and tender, shapely, strong, freckled hands. Face. There was no face seen. The brother's face was bent upon her fair, rain-fragrant hair. The hand, freckled and strong and shapely and caressing, was Davin's hand. He frowned angrily upon his thought and on the shriveled mannequin who had called it forth. His father's jibes at the Bantry gang leaped out of his memory. He held them at a distance and brooded uneasily on his own fault again. Why were they not Cranley's hands? Had Davin's simplicity and innocence stung him more secretly? He walked on across the hall with Dixon, leaving Cranley to take leave elaborately of the dwarf. Under the colonnade, Temple was standing in the midst of a little group of students. One of them cried, Dixon, come over to you here. The temple is in grand form. Temple turned on him his dark, gypsy eyes. You're a hypocrite, O'Keefe, he said, and Dixon's a smiler. By hell, I think that's a good literary expression. He laughed slyly, looking in Stephen's face, repeating, By hell, I'm delighted with that name. A smiler. A stout student who stood below them on the steps said, Come back to the mistress, Temple. We want to hear about that. He had faith, Temple said, and he was a married man too. And all the priests used to be dining there. By hell, I think they all had a touch. We shall call it riding a hack to spare the hunter, said Dixon. Tell us, Temple, O'Keefe said, how many quarts of porter have you in you? All your intellectual soul is in that phrase, O'Keefe, said Temple with open scorn. He moved with a shambling gait round the group and spoke to Stephen. Did you know that the Forsters are the kings of Belgium? he asked. Cranley came out through the door of the entrance hall, his hat thrust back on the nape of his neck, picking his teeth with care. And here's the wiseacre, said Temple. Do you know that about the Fosters? He paused for an answer. Cranley dislodged a fig seed from his teeth on the point of his rude toothpick and gazed at it intently. The Forster family, Temple said, is descended from Baldwin I, King of Flanders. He was called the Forester. Forester and Forster are the same name. A descendant of Baldwin I, Captain Francis Forster, settled in Ireland and married the daughter of the last chieftain of Clan Brasil. Then there are the Blake Forsters. That's a different branch. From Baldhead, King of Flanders, Cranley repeated, rooting again deliberately at his gleaming, uncovered teeth. Where did you pick up all that history? O'Keefe asked. I know all the history of your family too, Temple said, turning to Stephen. Do you know what Geraldus Cambrensis says about your family? Is he descended from Baldwin too? Asked a tall, consumptive student with dark eyes. Baldhead, Cranley repeated, sucking at a crevice in his teeth. Per nobilis et per familia, Temple said to Stephen. The stout student who stood below them on the steps farted briefly. Dixon turned towards him, saying in a soft voice, Did an angel speak? Cranley turned also and said vehemently, but without anger, Goggins, you're the flamingest dirty devil I ever met, do you know? I had it on my mind to say that, Goggins answered firmly. It did no one any harm, did it? We hope, Dixon said suavely, that it was not of the kind known to science as Paolo Post Futurum. Didn't I tell you he was a smiler, said Temple, turning right and left. Didn't I give him that name? You did. We're not deaf, said the tall consumptive. Cranley still frowned at the stout stoop below him. Then, with a snort of disgust, he shoved him violently down the steps. Go away from here, he said rudely. Go away, you stinkpot. And you are a stinkpot. Goggins skipped down onto the gravel and at once returned to his place with good humor. Temple turned back to Stephen and asked, do you believe in the law of heredity? Are you drunk, or what are you? Or what are you trying to say? asked Cranley, facing round on him with an expression of wonder. The most profound sentence ever written, Temple said with enthusiasm, is the sentence at the end of the zoology. Reproduction is the beginning of death. He touched Stephen timidly at the elbow and said eagerly, Do you feel how profound that is because you are a poet? Cranley pointed his long forefinger. Look at him, he said with scorn to the others. Look at Ireland's hope. 
They laughed at his words and gesture. Temple turned on him bravely, saying, Cranley, you're always sneering at me. I can see that, but I am as good as you any day. Do you know what I think about you now as compared with myself? My dear man, said Cranley urbanely, you are incapable, do you know, absolutely incapable of thinking. What do you know, Temple went on, what I think of you and of myself compared together? Out with it, Temple, the stout student cried from the steps. Get it out in bits. Temple turned right and left, making sudden feeble gestures as he spoke. I'm a Balax, he said, shaking his head in despair. I am, and I know I am. And I admit it that I am. Dixon patted him lightly on the shoulder and said mildly, And it does you every credit, Temple. But he, Temple said, pointing to Cranley, He is a Balax too, like me, only he doesn't know it. And that's the only difference I see. A burst of laughter covered his words, but he turned again to Stephen and said with a sudden eagerness, That word is a most interesting word. That's the only English dual number. Did you know? Is it? said Stephen vaguely. He was watching Cranley's firm-featured suffering face, lit up now by a smile of false patience. The gross name had passed over it like foul water poured over an old stone image, patient of injuries. And, as he watched him, he saw him raise his hat in salute and uncover the black hair that stood up stiffly from his forehead like an iron crown. She passed out from the porch of the library and bowed across Stephen in reply to Cranley's greeting. He also? Was there not a slight flush on Cranley's cheek? Or had it come forth at Temple's words? The light had waned. He could not see. Did that explain his friend's listless silence, his harsh comments, the sudden intrusions of rude speech with which he had shattered so often Stephen's ardent, wayward confessions? Stephen had forgiven freely, for he had found this rudeness also in himself towards himself. And he remembered an evening when he had dismounted from a borrowed creek bicycle to pray to God in a wood near Malahide. He had lifted up his arms and spoken in ecstasy to the somber nave of the trees, knowing that he stood on holy ground and in a holy hour. And when two constabulary men had come into sight round the bend of the gloomy road, he had broken off his prayer to whistle loudly at air from the last pantomime. He began to beat the frayed end of his ash plant against the base of a pillar. Had Cranley not heard him? Yet he could wait. The talk about him ceased for a moment, and a soft hiss fell again from the window above. But no other sound was in the air, and the swallows whose flight he had followed with idle eyes were sleeping. She had passed through the dusk, therefore the air was silent save for one soft hiss that fell, and therefore the tongues about him had ceased their babble. Darkness was falling. Darkness falls from the air. Trembling joy, lambent as a faint light, played like a fairy host around him. But why? Her passage through the darkening air, or the verse with its black vowels and its opening sound, rich and lute-like? He walked away slowly towards the deeper shadows at the end of the colonnade, beating the stone softly with his stick to hide his reverie from the students whom he had left, and allowed his mind to summon back to itself the age of Dowland and Bird and Nash eyes opening from the darkness of desire, eyes that dimmed the breaking east. What was their languid grace but the softness of chambering? And what was their shimmer but the shimmer of the scum that mantled the cesspool of the court of a slobbering steward? And he tasted in the language of memory amber wines, dying fallings of sweet airs, and the proud paton. And saw with the eyes of memory kind and gentle women in Covent Garden wooing from their balconies with sucking mouths and the pox-fouled wenches of the taverns and young wives that, gaily yielding to their ravishers, clipped and clipped again. The images he had summoned gave him no pleasure. They were secret and inflaming, but her image was not entangled by them. That was not the way to think of her. It was not even the way in which he thought of her. Could his mind then not trust itself? Old phrases, sweet only with a disinterred sweetness like the fig seeds Cranley rooted out of his gleaming teeth. It was not thought nor vision, though he knew vaguely that her figure was passing homeward through the city. Vaguely first, and then more sharply, he smelled her body. A 
conscious unrest seethed in his blood. Yes, it was her body he smelt, a wild and languid smell, the tepid limbs over which his music had flowed desirously, and the secret soft linen upon which her flesh distilled odor and a dew.